the, not good for everyone. We're all in, I guess, some of us are, like we heard, experiencing some hardship, and others are just, life is going really good right now. And so we fit well together to be here and be, be together and, and uh, have fellowship and share and learn from each other. So I really enjoy the sharing times that we have lately. There's lots of testimonies coming, and that is encouraging. That's good. That means that we are, we are searching, we're looking, and uh, experiencing and relating our, I guess, our lives to, to God, and uh, that is, that is good. It's what I'm trying to do, and and uh, think what we're try, what we're all doing. So, well, let's do that. Psalm 37, verse 4 says, "Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him." And he shall bring it to pass. I don't understand that those verses completely because there are some things that I have asked God for that haven't happened. But, and probably you have some as well. But the other thing, I also have to admit that I have not perfectly delighted myself in God all the time. And so that's another thing that is also true. And so let's take this verse and apply it and see what happens. Let's try. Hey, let's delight ourselves in God. In the Lord, and He will start working things out, and our desires and our delight in God and His will start intermingling and become one thing. I think that is a desire of, of the believer. And committing our ways to God, trusting in Him, and He will bring things to pass. Like Proverbs, I believe it's Proverbs 3 that says, right? That God, there's three qualifiers there, but then it says that. He will uh, show us the path or he will bring us along the path. Words don't uh, come to my mind right now. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I think. Uh, anyway, so let's do that. Let's look to God. Let's look to, look to Jesus. That's what we, what, we need to, what we need to do all the time. And also, especially in this time, uh, we, we want God. Without God, then uh, where would we be? Like someone shared that... Uh, I believe Victor shared it maybe before when, when we were singing, but yeah, what are, we, what are we saved from? What would I be if God hadn't saved me, if God hadn't intervened in my life? Where would I be today? That'd be a very ugly picture. And so it's not something we want to talk about long and even think about for yourself. You know, where would you be? What decisions would you have made? What had you already made? What path would you have continued on if God had not intervened in your life and you had not responded to him, uh, you know, Maybe we think, well, already now it is not as it should be everything. I'm not where I wish I would be, yet where would it be if, if we had not responded to God and if he hadn't helped us? So um, let's thank God. We have a lot of, lot of good things to, to think about. One uh, psalm that I think about is, uh, lately sometimes, maybe I've shared it before, but it's Psalm 1 that uh, talks about um, the blessedness of people who do not walk after the counsel of the ungodly and who do not stand in the way of sinners and who do not sit in the seat of the scornful. So what's a scornful person? What's a sinner? What's an ungodly person? Um, but it says, his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Sometimes we as believers get into a place where all week long we sit in the seat of the scornful. All week long we stand in the way of sinners. All week long we walk in the way of the, of the ungodly. And we listen to them and, and whatever, all, all that. And we feed off of that. But Sunday morning then we feed off the Bible. Then, or maybe in the morning for 15 minutes. And we feed off of God's word. And then we go back to sitting in the seat of the scornful. So... Let's not do that. Let's think about it. And I've had to think for myself. What am I feeding on? What is informing my th thinking? Uh, because what I feed on does uh, become my thought patterns, right? And so when I don't like the way I'm thinking, then I have to ask, what am I feeding on? Right? And so that is, it, it can be something good or it can be some good on that side or good on that, good on that side or good somewhere else. So with this, I'm not condemning any particular uh, idea. I'm just saying the thoughts that I'm feeding on, the people I'm getting information from, are they godly people 
Are they scornful people? Are they ungodly people? What, what it's informing? What am I feeding on? And so we know that godly people have some very different opinions, and that is good. That's fine. It's all good. But where am I taking my food from? What's the source? And so let's, <clears throat> let's talk, talk about that, and I appreciate the interaction that I can have with different ones of you, and, and we can talk about things that are hard, difficult to understand um, during the week, and that's good. I like that, and we need to air things out. We need to talk about things that trouble us or things that we don't understand. I don't understand everything either, and many things I don't understand, um, and I don't think anyone does. Some people have a lot of clarity these days about certain issues and think, oh, this is the way it is, and it... Well, uh, the other day somebody said, well, you know what, that this particular issue that they were thinking about, um, you know, we've looked at it from all sides and, and this, is, this is what we feel. So I was glad that they looked at it from all sides and so that's good. That's what we need to try to do. If we really want to know the truth, then I think we'll be willing to look at something from several sides. And so that's what we need to do and also take our information from a godly, a godly place. Um, the other day, uh, it wasn't one of you, but I had some interaction. Somebody initiated interaction with me over, over the uh, uh, modern or our today's current issues of surrounding COVID and vaccination and all of that and, and sent me some stuff that, that just really troubled me and at first frightened me. I thought, man, this can't be. It's, it's horrible. Um, but then as I took some time later to think about, you know, What's happening? What, 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 am I, what, what is this actually? I realize, well, there's no source either of the person talking. There's no identification. There's no source of, for the data that is being, being said. Um, some of the things that were said were something that even I, though I'm an ignorant person that doesn't know very much, even I could say that some of it wasn't true and wasn't biblical. Um, some of them maybe were true. There were a lot of things that were said that I didn't know whether they were true or not. I just simply didn't know. But there were some things I knew that weren't true. And so the other thing that I noticed this person was warning the world about inside knowledge that, that they had about the dis impending destruction that was coming on all of us. But while the warning was being given, the dire warning for all of us, just laughing and a happy, happy talk, right? And we're just, you know, it's good, but it was a warning for all of our destruction. That doesn't fit together. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit together. It's not truthful. It's garbage. Doesn't mean that everything that people say is, we have to disregard everything. But this particular thing, I just said, I can't waste my time on this. It's not worth my time. It, the only thing it's doing is driving fear, and whoever this is is probably making money with it. So that's why I'm saying, you know what? And it's a very dear uh, person that sent that to me. Um, so, you know what? Let's not ruin our lives over things that aren't, that are spurious and that are, uh, let's think about things that are truthful. That doesn't mean that I have to think this way or that I will arrive at that conclusion. What I'm saying is where do I take my information from? Is it a credible, truthful, reliable, godly source, or is it a scornful, ungodly, sinful source? Let's think about that. Or is there even a source? Is it just uh, 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 empty stuff to begin with? So that's my, my talk to you. And probably most of you do not concern yourself too much about things like that, but some of us do, and that is fine. Let's talk about them uh, sometime, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that. My concern for myself as becoming more and more exactly this. Where do I feed my soul? And that will impact what I think and the decisions I make and what is important to me and what I feed you on Sunday morning and my family during the week and my own heart, right? And so that doesn't mean that I have to shut out the whole world. No, some of us have to process things and we have to try to know. We have to come to conclusions. Some of us just go on with life and see how it happens. God has made us different and that is good too. But let's think about Psalm 1 as we, as we digest and as we think about things. The Bible says the people who will not walk in the counsel of the ungodly and will not stand in the way of sinners and will not sit in the seat of the scornful, but instead of that they will delight in the law of God, in the word of God, and they will be thinking day and night about his law. In other words, about the ways and words of God 
They will be like a tree planted by rivers of water and they will bring forth fruit and his leaf will not wither. All right, so again, it doesn't say what the conclusion of a particular matter will be. It just says the delight is in God's word and in God's ways and not in the ways of scornful uh, uh, things that, that are not driven by, by ultimately stemming from the truth of God. And so uh, there's more in Psalm 1 that we could uh, talk about. So that's my encouragement to you. Let's focus on things that, that uh, ultimately, in the end, will bring life and uh, take our sources of information from such places and learn to be discerning in, in those areas. I need to do that. Uh, and I'm trying to do that. I'm making efforts in that, and that's what I wish for you as well. So um, in the first service, I spent so much time laying background that I, we hardly got to the message, and uh, so I said to them that you didn't, we were not on a hard deadline for this service, so <laughs> you don't agree with that. I don't either. We have a good thoughts today. We want to look at a passage from uh, Romans that, people disagree very much on. Christian people disagree very much on the passage that we want to think at, look at today. And uh, I don't think there's anyone that completely understands it. And so then I felt like, well, then why am I going to preach about it? Because I don't know the Bible very well. Yeah, I know a lot about the Bible, but if the great theologians of the world of the last several hundred years have come to very different conclusions about this chapter, then who am I going to be to preach on this? But as uh, we are on the road, we're on the Romans road, so we're going to tackle Romans chapter 9 today. But before we go there, we want to go to First Peter. It's a good ba- backdrop or a good introduction to Romans 9. And... Uh, <clears throat> In uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, Paul, I'm sorry, Peter writing um, that we are lively stones. We're living stones that are being built into a house. So we don't build stones. Yesterday when we were driving, we, were dri- we drove by an uh, uh, old barn, I guess it must have been, that had fallen, uh, was falling apart. A lot of it still stood nicely, stone walls, like round, not like uh, home stones that were like squared blocks. It was just like round stones. So some guy, some farmer, uh, uh, I don't know how long ago, 100 years ago, 70 years, 60, 50, I don't know how long ago, built himself with his bare hands, pry bars, prying rocks out of the ground, bringing them to a place where he wanted to build a barn, and he built himself a nice barn with stones and strong enough for a nice solid roof to sit on. The roof was still sitting there. Part of the building was fallen down or crumbling, but it was still fairly and obviously not being used anymore. So you and I are stones in a building that God is building. And uh, so we are living stones, he says. So I don't know how to build much about building something with stones, but uh, Peter did, and uh, some of us do, and we see it sometimes. So it's nice when something is built well with stones. So that's in kind of in verse 5, maybe. We look at Jesus as, as, the, as our rock, right? Um, verse 6 says, about in the middle of the verse, it starts like this. I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Confounded means confused or ashamed or come to an end where there's no way further forward. Uh, so it's talking about Jesus. So God laid in Zion. Zion means in Israel, in Jerusalem, in his chosen nation. He lay a chief cornerstone there. Elect. Jesus was elect by God. He was chosen by God. He was precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So that is kind of ties in what I was saying before. If we want to include uh, all our controversies with that. If you set your heart and your affections on Jesus, you will not be confounded. You will not be ashamed. You will stay standing. When everything else has fallen and burned, you will be standing, not because of you, but because what you're standing on. That's because on Jesus. If you're building, if you're one of the rocks that is stone that is built onto the chief cornerstone, then you will remain standing when all else falls. Your soul will remain standing and will remain standing for all eternity. It's also an eternal uh, perspective. Unto you, therefore, if you're a living stone, if you're in Christ, unto you, he, Jesus, is precious. So to the Christian, to the believer, Jesus, this stone is precious. 
But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builder disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Okay, so there is already, we're getting to things that I don't fully understand. To a person that is built on Christ, that believes in Christ and accepts Christ, to them Jesus is precious. But to someone who is disobedient to God, knowingly disobedient to God, to them Jesus is an offense. Isn't that right? Have you had times where Jesus was an offense to you? Do you know people who are offended at Jesus? It's because it's a disobedient, hardening heart. And so how is Jesus to us? And it's talking here about wider, bigger things than just you and me today. It's talking also about historically about the Jewish people. We'll get into that in Romans 9. So there's several things. But we don't want to just talk about uh, theology. We want to talk about you and, and me today. So if I'm finding that Jesus is an offense to me, that Jesus is a stumbling block to me, um, then, then that means maybe I'm, I'm not, my heart is not yielded to him. If my heart is yielded to Jesus and I'm trusting him, then he is precious to me, right? You know what I'm talking about? You love Jesus. You're waiting for him to return. And you like coming to church or you like uh, being alone like somebody was sharing, right? It's a good time to be alone with God because God is precious to you. Jesus is precious to you. If Jesus isn't precious to me, then why is that? Um, so a question for us to think about. Uh, let's let Jesus be precious. So the preciousness comes from being yielded to him. If you yield yourself to Jesus and to his ways, he will become more and more precious as you do that. Sometimes that takes surrender and we have to, uh, like the sins in our life, obviously we need to uh, put away. Sometimes we have to um, give up other things for the sake of Christ. No, I would rather do this uh, instead of the, what I would have chosen to do because it's the right thing to do. So those kinds of things we could be talking about. Okay, so uh, there's that. So they were appointed, it says, to disobedience. So we'll get a little bit more into that later. It's talking about, I think, the, the Jewish nation, I believe, and also it could talk about other people, those who disobey Christ, those who refuse Christ, those are also appointed uh, to disobedience, I guess, to stumbling at Christ because it's just the way it is, the way God has set things up. If we reject Christ, um, we, we experience things that are appointed for those who are Christ. It doesn't mean that God has decided, oh, you are appointed to that and you are appointed to that. It's based on our decisions. That's like if you play baseball, right? There are rules you play by. If you strike out, then you're out. If you make a hit, then you run, right? That's just the rule of the, of the game. It doesn't mean that uh, somebody was chosen so they would strike out, right? So anyway... Getting ahead of myself here, verse 9 says, But ye, so it's talking about to those stones who are, have hope, those who are obedient to Christ, in other words, who are yielded to him, who are loving him, who have faith in him, that's ye. Ye are a chosen generation. God has chosen us too. He's not just chosen Jesus, he has chosen us. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar, strange people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So that describes us, doesn't it? A people, we were not a people. We were talking about the Gentile world in general, but we were not a people. And even Many of us, years back, didn't know each other. Many of us come from different places in the Americas. We didn't know each other, but I think for many of us, the reason we are here is because we have chosen to follow Christ. We've chosen to follow God. Not exclusively, but for many of us, that is the case. We can apply it that way. But more, it's talking about the church in general. When you meet a believer, when you're shopping, you're doing your business dealings, you come in contact with a believer, or when you're socializing, whatever, there's something that's a common bond. It's a connection, right? And so it's a people. You're a people together. You belong to the people of God. That is what it is actually talking about. A people of God. There was no nation. There other, if it wasn't for Christ, there would be no connection. There would be no nationhood. There would be no family. But because you also believe in Christ, now we are together and we count ourselves as brothers and sisters in Christ. We may not have a lot of interactions, but we know that we are on the same page 
as far as Jesus goes. And so if it wasn't for that, there would be nothing. And so that's what it's talking about. There was no nation, but God has called a church, a nation, a holy nation, a strange nation out that, uh, and the purpose of us is to show forth the praises of God and to be a light in the darkness. And so I think we all agree that there's a lot of darkness in the world. Our job is not to promote and to expand the darkness. Our job is to bring light and to be a light in the darkness and whatever our situations mean. So if we look at Romans 9, like I said, it's a chapter. and We have only a very short time to, to look at it. I don't know how many messages you would like on Romans 9. We'll try to make it one message. Um, and obviously, some of you have studied this uh, intensely on your own. I encourage you to do that if you haven't. Maybe you want to do it again if it's been several years already. Start telling some very, saying some very difficult things. And as I studied for it and as I listened to messages from different perspectives on this chapter and read some commentaries, I, uh, I have, for myself, from where I was at before, I've learned a couple of things. I don't know where you are at. So I hope everyone can learn something today. I hope we have all learned something already. Uh, so we want, I, my, my prayer is always that when we leave this place, we will be encouraged. We will uh, have something for our soul. Uh, learn, have learned something or have, yeah, have been instructed and, and encouraged. So may, may that happen and not... So, Romans 9, verse 1 says this, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. This is Paul talking. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. I thought Christians were always supposed to be very happy, right? Continual sorrow and continual heaviness in my heart. For I could wish that my... Wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So Christ, uh, I'm sorry, Paul, Paul wasn't depressed and discouraged because things weren't going his way. He wasn't depressed and discouraged because his body was unhealthy. That happens sometimes to us. He wasn't depressed and discouraged because of the world situation. Because their world situation was far worse than ours is. There are people today who live in situations similar to that, but not us. He was in heaviness and sorrow and heaviness or whatever it said. Continual sorrow and great heaviness. Because his people, the Jewish people, were not turning to Christ. That was causing him continual heaviness and sorrow in his heart. So that's lesson number one for me from Romans 9. How much heaviness and sorrow do I carry in my heart? Because there's so many of our people, and it could be other people too, that are not turning to Christ. Have I been sorrowful about that? Does that make my heart heavy? Or yours? I don't want to take us on a guilt trip, but maybe we should have a guilt trip about that. I think about the life that I have led the last week, last two weeks, last year, last 10 years. How much of that has been about sharing the gospel, sharing the kingdom of God or whatever, sharing God's words with those who don't know it or haven't fully understood it yet. So in other words, the missionary calling of the church. I find it challenging that Paul was in continual heaviness and sorrow, he's saying. I don't know what he meant by that. Was it now? Was it, did that, was that a defining thing in his preaching career? Because we know he... He gave up a lot and he went and preached and he spent, as far as we know of Paul, a major portion of his Christian life, he spent preaching and a lot of the time exactly to Jewish people, also a lot of time to Gentile people. So that's the first lesson for us from Romans 9. Because what made this especially hard for him 
and we can make some comparisons to our the culture of people if we're talking about the plot each culture it doesn't have to be that it could be anything but if we think about that we can make some comparisons to that but it's not talking about that it's talking specifically about the jewish people because god has a specific plan for them he has elected and chosen them for something special but paul is saying you know what we our people the jewish people he's saying had the prophets we had abraham we had moses we had the 10 commandments on mount sinai we had the red sea we had manna we had Canaan. We had Jericho walls falling down. We had the prophets. We had the temple, all the ceremonies at the temple. We had God's ways revealed to us in a special way. We're a truly a chosen people of God. And yet, we're not turning to God for the most part. And he finds that very sad. The people who had the promise, who's the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Christ came through us in the flesh, he's saying, from the Jewish people. That was God's plan. We'll look more at that soon. But they rejected him. We, or the Jewish people, the, the Israelites, had rejected him. One of the questions about Romans 9 is, why are we talking about this? And so one of the reasons that I think Paul was talking about this is because isn't Romans about salvation, about justification, about the Christian life? Why are we talking about this? Uh, part of the reason is because some of Paul's audience were also Jewish people, Jewish believers. So Paul has just said in Romans 8 that nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. Uh, elsewhere in Romans 5 and so on, he said uh, about our salvation, that we're justified by our faith. But now, if, we, if they thought about their people, it seemed like God's plan hadn't worked. God had worked with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all that stuff in Egypt and through the desert and in Canaan and through all the prophets and kings and everything God had worked so hard with the people. Always kept going when they fell and kept, you know, just kept the thing going. And now Jesus finally came and they didn't even receive him. And they rejected him. So what's with God's word? And now you're saying, well, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ and we're justified by faith and all those things. I think that's one of the things, I don't know if that's a major point, but I think that could be one of the reasons he writes about this, to say that God's plan isn't done yet, not even for the Jewish uh, people. Um, because that's what he says in verse 6. Not as though, it's not as though the God, word of God has taken none effect, as if God's word is useless. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. He's making a distinction between Israelites, if we want to call them that, very precious, very wonderful people, chosen people of God. But not all of them believed. Not all of them had faith in God. We know that like from the time of Jesus, we know that. The leadership, especially of that time, rejected Jesus. We just read about in First uh, Peter, they rejected this stone. They rejected Jesus. And uh, he was a stone of offense to them. Uh, so many of them stumbled at Jesus, but not all of them. And so there were some that had faith, like even back, like King David or the prophets, obviously. And there must have been many other people, like when Jesus was born, the the prophetess, what was her name again, that was in the temple, and, and uh, the, the older man that was there. There were people that were waiting for Jesus. They had faith. For them, it was not just an empty temple ritual like we sometimes uh, describe it. There were people of faith, and that's what he's talking about. They're not all Israel. Just because you're physical descendants uh, of Abraham doesn't mean, or of Israel, doesn't mean that you are actually in faith. That's what I understand he's saying. And uh, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. We know that Abraham, can't spend a lot of time in it, you can study it up, but Abraham had more children than Isaac. Obviously there was Ishmael, and then also he had later another wife, I think after Sarah died or whatever, a concubine, something you'll find it in the Old Testament. You can look it up, he had more children yet afterwards. And so, the, but the promise was given to the only son of Abraham and Sarah. 
And so it, that, is, that was God's election happening there. It wasn't, and that was something that God promised Abraham already long before those boys were born, right? And so uh, he had chosen that way, the, this uh, seed of Abraham and Sarah. That's where the promise would come through. The promise is the one he made to Adam and Eve when they sinned. He said there will be a seed that will come and he will bruise the serpent's head. That's what it's talking about. So now God is actively working in Abraham and it would come through Isaac. So it's not all the seed of Abraham that are children but in Isaac shall I see be called. Okay, and then going onward. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son, and not only this. Okay, so yeah, it was promised that Sarah would be the mother of the child, right? Of the promise. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Again, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Okay, so there's a couple of difficult things there, which I don't all understand, which people strongly disagree over. But that's okay, we don't need to do that. Um, you can take some things and apply them and try to understand some things. But... Uh, do you ever struggle with that uh, Esau and Jacob? They're twin boys, and so Isaac was now the promise, and so the seed would come through Isaac, but what do you do now that you have twin boys? Which one is it going to be? So God chose Jacob. Uh, technically, he should have chosen Esau because he was the older one, right? Um, but he chose the younger one. So when God decided, that was before the boys were born, God knows everything, so he knew that they were twins. And so... God chose the younger one, uh, Jacob. And uh, was it because Esau was a bad boy that he rejected him? Was Jacob such a nice boy that God chose him? They weren't born yet when he chose them. Even in that Old Testament time, it wasn't of works. That's what he's saying. It was according to the choosing of God. So that's one thing to know. Another thing to know is the choosing that God was doing here, and this was very helpful to me in thinking about what election is and what we're talking about. Because on the one hand, you have people, and, and uh, I, I'm fine with that. I don't reject all of their doctrine. Uh, there's a lot that I've learned from the Calvinist, but the perspective that, that God chooses some people for salvation and the others he rejects and, and chooses to send to hell. He makes them, they're born, and he chooses you are unelect just for whatever reason, somehow for my glory, and you go to hell, and some of you I will choose, and you can go to heaven. That kind of election, I don't believe in. It's not what it's talking about. We're not talking about salvation. He's talking about choosing a lineage to build a people from which the Messiah would come, which is a totally different thing. This wasn't a salvation thing with Jacob and Esau. Does that make sense? To me, that was very helpful when I uh, thought about it that way. And so, um, what shall we say then? Okay, the other thing I wanted to point out, it says, Esau have I loved and Jacob have I hated. That always uh, tr troubles me too, but at the same time, Jesus says, if you don't hate your father and mother and come after me, then you're not worthy or you can't be my disciple. Something like that. You know that verse, right? What does he say? Does that mean that when I sit in a counseling room with a young person, a teenager, and he wants to become a believer, I should first make sure they hate their parents before they can become a Christian? Because Jesus says that if you, unless you hate your parents, you can't be my disciple. Is that what it means? If we literally read it, we could, obviously it's absurd, right? I'm not suggesting that that is a possibility, that that is what he's meaning. And so we have to use the Bible to explain itself, right? So if Jesus says you have to hate your father and mother, otherwise you can't be my disciple, that means what some of our, our church people have experienced that they have been rejected by their parents because they became Christians, right? And so you have to be willing to make that sacrifice. That's, I think, what we always understand from that. And so I think that same identi <clears throat> uh, definition of love and hate can be applied here as well and probably should be. It's not... It's just, it was a choosing for the lineage, for the Messiah, for the seed. That's what this was. It wasn't, Esau, you're condemned to hell even before you're born, and Jacob, you're condemned to heaven even before you're born. 
That is the way some people would interpret that. This is talking about choosing a lineage for the seed for the Messiah to come. That's how I understand that. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, for he hath said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. We know that Esau pled desperately. He wanted his, first, his birthright back, didn't he? Very, very badly. But it's not of him that wills or of him that is very zealous for whom the calling was. I don't know how well we can tie that in, but I think in a, way, in a part we can. It wasn't like the Jewish, like even Paul himself, when he was persecuting the church before he became a Christian, he was a very zealous follower of God in his mind, right? He was zealous, and the other Jews, they were so zealous that they killed the Messiah. Zeal, zeal and sincerity is not the same as faith in Jesus Christ. It is not that which makes you right with on the right side of God. Zeal, there's, there are very many people that are very zealous about things that are not right. And so, um, maybe he'll get into that more. I'm not sure if I jumped ahead of myself here. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will have, on whom he will he hardeneth. <clears throat> okay? So that's another difficult point. Forgive me for trying to even talk about that. So what do we do with Pharaoh? If God hardened his heart. Poor Pharaoh, right? Have you ever felt sorry for a Pharaoh? Uh, I sometimes feel sorry for people that other people don't feel sorry for. Um, so I don't know. I don't think I've ever felt sorry for Pharaoh. But in a way, you almost could, right? Poor Pharaoh. He drowned in the Red Sea with his army. Poor guy. He lost his whole country. He lost his firstborn son because God hardened his heart. Is that how we look at it? Can we look at it that way? Should we look at it? The Bible also uh, says when it talks about Pharaoh, in that story exactly, you would find that Pharaoh hardened his heart as well. And that right there is a very sobering message for you and me. And so what this chapter is about, I think, and this whole topic is about how God's will works with our will. We are a called people. Jesus said in John chapter 6, at least, that no one can come to God unless God draws him. But also we find elsewhere, whoever wants to may come, right? So we find all of that in, in the Bible. And so some of God's will works with our will. And God is sovereign and he can do whatever he wants, but he also gives us free will. Did God tell Adam and Eve that they had to eat that fruit and they did it because God wanted them to? Like, are we calculators? When you do two plus four equals, what's two plus four, my young friends? You go to school, you learned it, right? Anybody want to say two plus four? That's six, right? Did I get it right? Yeah, I did. Good. Because I used to always struggle with what's seven times seven. I remember yet when I learned it. And my teacher said, that's 49. And some of that clink, clicked in my mind. And then from then, I always knew 7 times 7 is 49. I never had to wonder anymore. That's one that I know, even today. So when you do in your calculator 7 times 7, that's always 49, right? Are we calculators that God just punches numbers and that's just the result? Is that what happened with Adam and Eve? Is that ha what happened with Pharaoh? I don't think so. How many... Chances did Pharaoh have to obey God? How many times did Moses go to Pharaoh and said, God says, let my people go? Can we say that Pharaoh had no chance? He had, he had a number of chances, right? Pharaoh hardened his heart and God hardened his heart. That distinction, I don't know how to make, but it is both true. Just like about COVID, if you want to talk about that. There's that wild side. There's that wild side. So we don't have to be extreme. We can take, probably the truth is somewhere in the middle. And I think it's, does just God harden people's heart and we're just like a computer input equals output? 
or are we completely free and God just lets us do completely whatever and it's just if I can live my whole life a fleshly, sinful, horrible life and knowing all the time that sometime a few minutes before I die I want to quickly become a Christian yet then I'll have the best of both worlds we live a sinful, fleshly, indulgent life and then I'll have all eternity with God because I'll quickly become a Christian yet before I die can we make plans like that? no it doesn't work that way either God calls. If he doesn't call, we can't come. But it also says, I believe he calls everyone. If you look at Romans 1 or Revelation 22, anyone may come. God doesn't want anyone to be lost. So the truth is both. Both things are true that God wills and we will. It works together somehow. I can't explain exactly how. Today, exactly, I couldn't say in one sentence, okay, then this is exactly how it works. But Pharaoh had chances. The other thing, piece I find in what hardening is. Some of you work with lumber, hard lumber, soft lumber, treated lumber. Some of you work with steel. There's uh, steel, you can send it somewhere and then they harden it, right? Does that change mild steel into stainless steel? No, it just takes that steel that you sent and hardens it. it. In a way we could say it makes it more of what it already was, right? I don't know if that is a good way of saying it. It hardens it. Like your lumber, if you send oak to the treating plant, it doesn't become cedar at the plant, right? Or if you send spruce there, it stays spruce. It just becomes treated and harder, I guess, right? When I think about hardening Pharaoh's heart in that way, that makes sense to me. Pharaoh was who he wanted to be. And he was making decisions based on his wisdom. They needed slaves to keep their economy going. How else, and their power going, how else will you do it? You can't let all the slaves go. That would ruin our country. So he hardened himself against God, and God hardened him in that position. If that is what you are, what you want. And so, obviously, God had a plan. Again, we're talking here not about salvation. We're talking here about the seed. God had a chosen people. They were slaves in Egypt, which had been prophesied. And they needed to go back to Canaan. He was calling his people. They needed to be because the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem one way or another. These people needed to leave Egypt and go to Canaan, the promised land, right? So that's what was at play here. Not necessarily salvation, though that is also impacted. I see my time is running by really fast. Let's see what else we learn here. I don't know if you, I'm losing you, if I'm talking things that make sense or things that you agree with. Um, gladly... Talk to me later, send me a message or whatever, we can talk about it. The most learned theologians disagree on this chapter. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. And uh, not just because I want to be a coward, because I think that's what it is. It's not just God's will, and it's not just our will. It's God's calling and our response. Like it says in Romans 8, God um, 28. Romans 8, 20, it says, We know that all things work together for good to them who, that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, right? So God calls us, and we love him in response. And if that is our situation, uh, everything will work for good for us. So, that, I mean, that is one place. You know, there's so many places in the Bible where our choice is referenced. Also, many places where God's will is referenced as well. So they work together. <clears throat> and so God works things for glory in the long term. Uh, so the question for us then, uh, when we think about Pharaoh and his hard heart, the part that God played in it, but more importantly, the part that he played in it. The question is for myself, the question is for you. In the state that your heart is today, would you okay, be okay with it being hardened in that situation? Locked into place. Have we stopped working with God like Pharaoh? He says, nope. Whatever he thought of Moses and Aaron, he knew enough to know that something, especially after several plagues that happened. He knew enough here, I use, I'm dealing with something extraordinary here, right? But he still had his plan for his economy, for his workforce, for his whatever their his plan was for his pharaoh ship and his dynasty that was at odds with God's plan. And so where your plan 
where our plan and God's plans are at odds with each other, who wins? God is always God that wins, but that is a place where we need to realize that then I need to go God's way, not my way. And if Pharaoh had done that, I'm not sure how God would have said that. If Pharaoh had just said, okay, well, then let the people go. If that's what God wants, these people need to leave. What if he had said, well, then go by all means, and here's a bunch of money and take a lot of animals, whatever, just go. If that is what God, and this is a living God, then go, right? How would that have happened? Or what would have happened? I don't know. It didn't happen that way. God would have, I'm sure, gotten a lot of glory from that too. So there are things I don't understand, but this is how it happened. And so God is merciful, but he is also also God and all-powerful. It's both true. And uh, so um, we can come to God only if he calls, but also he will call us. It's also both true. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Okay, we had done that. Um, <clears throat> so verse 19, I believe, let's look at that. Why, for wilt thou say unto me, why hath he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? So if we put Jacob and Esau into that verse, it makes perfect sense. All right? Why Esau could have said, he said, like, Why did you choose Jacob? Why didn't you choose me? I'm the oldest one. You should have chosen me. I think... I find peace with thinking of it in that context, especially, maybe applies otherwise as well. So are we okay with the way God does things? Sometimes we're not, and it causes us great struggle and a lot of stress. And so we come to peace when we are okay with the way God does things. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power unknown, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, like Pharaoh, for example, with much long suffering, ten plagues, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he hath afore prepared unto glory, people of Israel that he was freeing. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles, also applies to us, as he hath said also in Osi, I will call them my people, that's Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. So that is talking about us, he says. Even us. Not Jews only, but also Gentiles. If God had not poured out the Holy Spirit on the whole world, like we read in Acts, then we would not be the people of God. Before I spent a little bit of time on the connection that people of, in Christ have, right? We're a family of God, we like to say. We're a people of God because we're believers. We're in Christ. We have a mutual salvation, a joint salvation in Christ. So there's a connection. We are, recognize that and we live with that and we, it's establishing something between us. <clears throat> that would not be there if it wasn't for Christ, right? That would just not be there. It would just be an average business or social relationship. Where there was no people in the Gentile world, there is now a people. Where it was said, there, are no, there is no nation, there is now a nation, like we read in First Peter. A holy nation, a peculiar, odd, strange people. Because they're following Christ, they have faith. They don't go according to, like we read in Psalms 1. And it shall, verse 26, let's read that. Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isn't that what we call ourselves? Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. And that is sadly true. Um, the Jewish people are very special people, a very wonderful people. And God has worked with them wonderfully throughout the ages. And yet when the Redeemer came, there was only a remnant that received him. And we read about more of them in Revelation. And so God, I think, has a plan. Uh, we could talk more about that. But we, we read about that. And, and I, I believe we find even at the end time, that during the tribulation, the Antichrist will deal with the children, uh, with the 
Israel people. God has a plan. There is chosen, they're a chosen people in the way that the rest of us are not. But of them, only a remnant are saved. Only a remnant have so far received Christ. Most of them stumble at the idea of Christ the Messiah. Even though they be as the sand of the sea, like God promised Abraham they would be. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. It's talking about the end time. God will cut something short. Um, and as Isaiah, Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would be as, had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. Cities that were burned up with fire and brimstone, right? It's talking about that. In the end, there will be something we don't know and we don't expect to be there to see it. But there will be, things will be so dire that if God would not cut the work short, the whole world, especially the Jewish world, it would be burned up like Sodom and Gomorrah. So God will shut it, cut it short so that there will be a remnant even at that time. That's what I understand from these verses. And so there is hope uh, for, even for, for them. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. That's the beautiful thing. That's for us. The Gentiles, who were not a people, who had not followed after righteousness, like you and me, like the Gentile world in general, hasn't followed after righteousness. They have not followed after God. They have lost the knowledge of God sometime after Noah. Some remnants of that knowledge is in almost every culture of the flood, for example, and of creation. So on their stories, if you study that, it's very fascinating. But the pure knowledge or whatever that knowledge has been lost. They have not sought after righteousness and the Gentile world had fallen into devil worship and idol worship and all kind of pagan rituals and darkness, right? But from there, those people, that includes our forebears somewhere down the line as well. That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness is, which is of faith. We have heard about Jesus. We have heard the gospel and we have responded to it. And we have started to love God and we have got light of Christ and God's word into our hearts. And we grow and we work in that and we study in that and we have become a people of God because through faith. And we have attained unto the righteousness of God through our faith. Not because we were Jews or not because we were so good, but like Jacob, without our own choice. The Holy Spirit poured out, we have heard the word, we have heard the gospel, and we have responded in faith, and our faith in Christ makes us righteous. The righteousness of Christ and makes it also possible, more possible to live a practically righteous life. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. And that is the, the sad thing because, and it says in verse 32, why not? Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. So we can talk here about Caiaphas, the high priest, and so on, right? The Jewish leaders of Jesus' day. Most of them stumbled at Jesus because Jesus upset their structure that they had made for themselves. It originated in the Ten Commandments. It originated in the book of Leviticus and all of that. But eventually so much added to it, it had become a power structure and a wealth structure and a religious structure that worked for them. And it, Jesus threatened it majorly because if Jesus' teachings were true, then their power structure would crumble. Right? So here's an example. Jesus went and he went to the pool of Siloam. And there was this man, and we got to stop here, but there was this man, he had been laying there for X amount of years as a cripple, and these other people that he healed, and he healed them on the Sabbath day, and they were jumping, and they were happy, and carrying their bed, or so happy, now they could see, right? There are how many stories like that are there in the Gospels? That's what Jesus did. What did the power structure say? He said, you were healed on the Sabbath? Who did that? We do not work on the Sabbath. We have trouble. It is no wonder that people thronged to Jesus. Right? People who were living under that pyramid 
of power and wealth and religion. Here came a man who said, do you like to be well? I would like you to be well. Please stand up and walk. And he stood up and walked and his life was changed. Regardless of what day of the week it was, doing the work of God. It is no wonder that these, this pyramid felt threatened by Jesus. They stumbled at him. And that the people thronged after him, right? Anyway, they stumbled at the stumbling stone of Christ. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And that's a beautiful thing I want to leave you with. If you're in Christ, the chief cornerstone, you build your life on him. You look to Jesus in your life. You will not be ashamed. That doesn't mean that you'll never be embarrassed because at Fospan, when I go visit your house, sometimes I take the wrong fork or whatever. I don't pass the right way or whatever, right? Some, uh, maybe not at your house. I've had that, so it's embarrassing, right? That's not what it's talking about. We'll not be ashamed. We're setting, as a believer, you are setting your life on something that is contrary to worldly thinking, right? It goes against the grain. It's not part of the scornful, part of the unbelieving, sinful world. You're setting your hope on an eternal thing that is contrary to the way the world thinks. If you do that, you will not be ashamed though. Today you will face pressure and oppression because of it, but in the end you will not be ashamed if you build it because Jesus, it is, and that's why Christians are an offense. Jesus is an offense in the world. But he who believes on him, he who builds, becomes a rock in the building of, on Christ, will not be ashamed. That building will always stand. So. That is the encouragement that we can have, both a challenge but an encouragement. Let's build on the rock. Let's stand on that rock. Whatever we feed on, whatever we build on, whatever we plan for our life, let's build it on Jesus. Let that be it. To look at him, we will never be ashamed. We will never be put to shame. It will never be proven that we were wrong. It will be proven that Christ was right. And if we are with him, on him, then that is where we want to be. So let's do that and make it part of our week. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Uh, we recognize there are some things we don't understand and may never understand until we see you face to face, but then it will make perfect sense. But for today, we believe in you. We thank you for your free salvation, that you are a rock uh, that made us stumble until we realized we could build on you, that you had mercy and you built us on you and you helped us. And thank you for that. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your... Uh, provision for our soul that we find nurture there and nourishment help us to choose you as we go through this week help us to have faith help us to have courage in you and help us to when we come to these decisions that are at odds with between the fleshly or worldly or carnal way of thinking uh, that is at odds with you help us give us the strength and the insight to choose your ways in the name of jesus amen